Welcome to episode 42 of the AR-15 podcast. I'm your host, Jake Chalen, with co-host Reed Schneider. This is the podcast that shines a positive light. No, wait, wrong show. This is your podcast about your favorite black rifle. This show is for you, whether you're building your first AR or you've been building ARs for years. There's something we can all do to take our black rifle to the next level. And we have a special guest today. We have Ari from Rainier Arms. Hey, Ari, how are you doing? Hey, doing well, Drake. Thank you very much. Um, it, you're the uh, marketing, marketing director over there. Uh, mm -hmm. So how long have you been at R Rainier? Uh, I've, been a, I've been with Rainier for about three years now. I started over in uh, 2010. Well, very cool. Uh, and we're going to talk a little bit about three-gun competition, and a sp uh, you know specifically the AR-15. I, mm -hmm. I guess you do a little bit of competition shooting yourself. Yeah, yeah, I do. We we actually have a uh, shooting team uh, that I'm the captain of. Um, but prior to that, I'd I'd been a part of a couple other shooting teams from across the U.S. Well, I already screwed up your intro. Rainier <laughs> Arm shooting captain. <laughs> Free gun team shoot. I can't even do that right. Um, so, so Ari, how how did you get into guns? Did, did you grow up, you know, around guns? Did your fam was your family into shooting, hunting, anything? Like oh yeah, that? yeah, yeah. I, I've got um, a lot of my brothers are either military, law enforcement, and I think the fascination started when I was about six years old, and I saw my uncle shoot shoot his gun, shoot a gun, uh, and uh, um, Actually, even before that, we went to a swap meet, and I remember we were actually selling at the swap meet, and the gentleman next to me was leaving, and he had this big stack of guns and ammo as magazines. He looked over at me and said, hey, you want a couple magazines? And I, I grabbed a couple of them, and I remember keeping these and hiding them for my parents, you know, and reading through them at night. It was almost like, you know, normal kids had the nudity magazines, and I had these guns and ammo magazines studying them and just being generally fascinated about them, so... Well, that, that's uh, that is, some people might call that not normal, but I, I'm okay with that. <laughs> I, I'm not normal. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's awesome. So, yeah. uh, how how did you uh, come to work for a gun company? Did you uh, tell us about that transformation? Well, I mean, prior to me coming here to Rain Your Arms, I'd actually worked for a a big telecommunications company, and uh, I spent my first ten years over there as a senior systems analyst. Um, um, I had been shooting competitively, um, you know, it, it, at that time, and um, it, it was the fascination grew and grew to the point where I said, I don't like what I'm doing. I don't want to die doing this type of job. And I said, hey, you know, I discussed it with my wife, and it was maybe five years in the making. Um, and I was on a, uh, on a local gun forum, and I basically put my faith on the line and I started this thread I said hey what do you guys think and they said you know what you should go for what you you, you know and life is short so here we are well it sounds like that was good advice yeah yeah it, it actually worked out real well so well how did you make the transition did you find yourself a home in Rainier Arms or was it a, a kind of an easy progression into the industry or was it just both uh, feet into the deep end. A, a little bit. Um, the store was actually, um, you know, it, it kind of bled it, it, it. That wasn't my entirely my my sole purpose. I, I we were raising a family at the time, and I said, you know what, I, I couldn't do this 50, 60 hour a week deal. Um, I needed to stay a little closer to home at that time. My commute was a little over an hour, um, you know, and. Coincidentally enough, a lot of the guys that were on the forums that actually knew the owner, John, real well and spoke highly about him. And, um, you know, so, you know, the fact that they were so close to home and, you know, this, this guy was uh, that had a shop just right down the street from me. I, I just shot him a, a, a shot in the dark email and said, hey, you know, this is who I am. This is what I like to do. And, you know, a, a day later I got an email back said, hey, why don't you come in? I'd love to talk to you. So, and that's that's basically it. Well, that's a pretty big leap of faith there. It, it is, yeah. Well, so uh, what, what kind of transitioned you 
uh, into the shooting side of things. Had you been competing before you made that transition into the industry? Oh yeah, oh yeah. Um, a good friend of mine, uh, this, the my, the hobby before shooting took over my life, so to speak, um, was, was fishing. I had a good fishing buddy. I said, "Hey, you know you're fascinated with firearms. Have you ever tried competing?" And it, it maybe took him several months um, to to get me out there, but. I, I tell you, I remember he took a picture of my very first stage that I shot, and I still have it. And um, it was at that point when the buzzer went off, and to the point where my hands were shaking, and he, the range officer was telling me to uh, unload and show clear. I, I knew I had to continue doing this, um, and it, it got to a point where I shot a couple of matches, and I said, you know, what do you guys do in this month time that you have to wait for the next match? And they go, what are you talking about? We keep shooting. So and, and it was almost like a gateway. <laughs> After that, I went into plates. I started shooting plates, and and that's when I started getting into the heavy stuff, which is USPSA. Um, and in my region, you know, or at least in my section, that was something that you can do every single weekend. So I said, hey, that's awesome. So yeah, that's kind of how I made my start. And I think it was three months later, I bought my reloader. Um, I bought a Dillon 550, and uh, the rest is history. After that, I think that. Reloader has reloaded hundreds, if not thousands, hundreds of thousands of, of 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 ammo between my brother and I. My brother and I actually went half on it, and uh, you know it's, the rest is kind of history. Um, well, now does he feel like he gets an even shake at it, or you in there using it more often than not? Oh yeah, I, the reloader. <laughs> yeah. Oh no, what what eventually happened was a couple of months later I bought him out. I said, hey, you know what? <laughs> you get your own, all right? <laughs> <laughs> no, he, he, he was already making plans. Um, so, you know, because I, I lived over in Kent. He lived over in West Seattle. It was a good 45-minute commute. He said, I'm tired of coming over here, you know, keeping it at your house. So, you know, he's got two 650s now. I still have the same 550 we started with. So. Well, so, so no, I'm, curi I'm curious what your first uh, rifle was for 3-Gun. Do you remember what the first build was? Oh, it was it was a it was an AR-15. I mean, it was a uh, it was something pretty close to our ruck now. Um, when I fr built my first Rainier Arms rifle, it it looks almost exactly what the, like the ruck is now. So, um, it, so it's a, I like to say I had one of the first rucks, but <laughs> well, well, describe to listeners what what is a ruck. Oh, the, our, our ruck. Uh, was a, our first intro into manufacturing rifles. It was a standard 16-inch um, government profile um, a barrel with a um, Samson Evolution that they had done for us. It was the Rainer Arms uh, uh, version uh, of the Samson rail, uh, standard upper and lower combo. When we first introduced it, we had the Geisley trigger in there. Um, and we had the Voltor stock. Um, today, we've got several variations of the Ruck. You know, so um, you, it's we found that a lot of our uh, customers wanted to configure their, I mean, as well put together as our ruck was, they had all these little different things that they wanted to do with it. So you know, there was some things that you know we heard more often than others. So we started, you know, as we progressed, started creating different versions of rucks. Well, tell me, do you uh, what what length barrel do you uh, have on your competition setup? Uh, on my main go-to go competition stuff, I actually have it right here now. It's a 20-inch um, barrel. Um, a lot of guys, uh, this this has been kind of the setup, either the 18.5 or the 20-inch barrel. And um, a lot of guys have going, started to go shorter. Um, I still uh, like the 20-inch rifle length uh, setup. I feel like it shoots really soft. Um, even with uh, close quarter stuff, there's a lot of hosers type stages where rifles are inside of 75 yards. I don't feel like I have too much barrel, um, you know, going in and out of ports. I kind of find I, I've got a different approach to things. Um, I, I feel like it's more of a training issue than than a uh, equipment limitation issue. Um, but you know, other people have got you know their own theory on on what what, what a good uh, uh, three gun rifle is. Um, so this is. Just a, a rifle I'm very comfortable with, and and that's 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 I think is key um, is having a, a rifle that you know inside and out, and you're very confident in. Well, well let me take you it get... from there. Well, hold on a second. Okay. When when you have a a 
choice, you're, you're basically espousing the idea that if you're comfortable with it, if it's what you know, then you should mm -hmm. be able to take it into a competition and use it. So Absolutely. Absolutely. any one of our listeners who's sitting there with a build in, in the safe doesn't have to wait until he gets a custom no, free gun. No, absolutely rating. not. All right, so I, I, I talked to a lot that? of our I talked to a lot. I talked to a lot of customers that are um, either intrigued or ready to go into three gun. And they, that question is always asked. Do you think I have the right gear? And I say no. I, I think you've got. I mean, my recommendation because I, I I was a safety officer for a long time is run what you brung. I mean, whatever you have now, just run it, and you'll find out. For, for yourselves and and the best thing to do is to just shoot with what you got um, and ask questions you know and, and keep asking questions and ultimately you will kind of build that rifle uh, but for the most part if you've got a rifle that you are confident in I don't care if it's a standard M4 14.5 inch barrel AR with a iron sights run it um, and you know because I, I, I honestly believe um, you really don't know the potential of your rifle until you're pushed um, to do all the uncomfortable things that, with it that you maybe have never tried. And those are things that you'll never realize at the range from shooting static on a bench, you know. Um, and even my, myself, uh, prior to me competing, I, I remember when I first turned 18 years old, um, 8 o'clock in the morning going to our local gun shop and buying my first AR-15, you know, and um, that, that and, and you know, it, you have this theory of what you think the perfect AR is, you know, because I was already on AR15.com looking at how other people are setting up their guns, and for the most part, I would maybe shoot my rifle six, seven, eight times a year. Um, but you know, I, I built my stuff based on what people said, how 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 it looked, and then when you go and actually run the gun, you go, wait a minute, that doesn't work for me. <laughs> that Glock that I had. That I, I swore up and down would never jam. When I'm jam jamming that thing through ports and running it in the rain and the snow, guess what? It jams. You know, <laughs> so anything and everything, I you, you have to challenge it. You know, right. and you never quite know. And that's what I love about competition. It really is. There's no hiding the truth to it. You know, you could you could say, hey, this race gun is going to do this. It's going to do that. Well, let's let's see it do it. You know. <laughs> So I mean, th my theories has greatly changed at when I got into competition. Actually, my first year of competition, I was a really—I I mean, I wasn't a heavy gun collector. I'd say I've maybe had 20, 25 rifles and pistols in my collection. I think I sold over two thirds of that to buy bullets, and also because I realized those guns didn't do quite what I thought they would do. Right. So you know, my whole theory had changed. The competition really evolved my methodologies and theories around firearms. Well, before we get too far ahead of ourselves, uh, let's get back to basics. So, Ari, can, can you uh, describe for the listeners and viewers what is 3-Gun? Oh, well, 3-Gun, and it's, it's just as the name states, you, you, it's the discipline surrounding uh, your rifle, your shotgun, and your pistol. Um, and it incorporates course of fires that forces you to use as, um, you know, each one of those things in different elements. And... What I really find um, the most fun is the gamesmanship around it. And you'll find later on as you start to compete, it, it becomes less about equipment and more about the shooter and its mindset and the ability for them to figure out these puzzles that are course of fires. Um, if people ask me all the time about, um, you know, well, when I talk to people that want to get into it, they always feel as though they are not able to because they have to practice or they have this... Um, feeling that they're incompetent to do so sort of thing and I tell them all the time it has nothing that nothing you can do will ever prepare you for what we have you know and it's 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 something that you just have to get into doing and 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 just commit to it I, I have friends all the time oh I would love to do that but I'm not good enough and then I take them to the range and I show them some of my you know 25 yard groups and they go wow I thought you would be much better than that. It's like no, it's uh, it's a lot. There's a lot of shooting involved, but you really have to be good with improving and 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 figuring things out and executing it more than anything. So, yeah, I like what you said about uh, 
the puzzle aspect of it, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Where, where you're looking at a stage and you're like, how, how do I do this? Because uh, mm -hmm. I, I, I just, I, I don't shoot very often uh, a competition, but I did a three gun yesterday, actually. And this one stage, you know, guys were going through it for a good 10 minutes just looking at the stage trying to figure out how to run it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's that's a big part of it. I would say you're, you figuring out how to do things is a bigger part than equipment or shooting, actual shooting talent. I mean, don't get me wrong. There are shots that, you know, unless you pr truly practice it and you're a talented shooter, you're not going to pull off. You know, it, it just goes the same theory of you, you will only default to your last level of trading. You will not magically rise to the occasion and turn into Jack Bauer all of a sudden. You know, you... You will always, and that's where you see where your deficiencies really lie. It's not, and it's usually not in the equipment. Right. <laughs> it, it it certainly helps. I, yeah. Don't don't get me wrong. I, I'm probably a terrible salesman right now because I'm telling you it's not about the equipment. Um, but my theory has always been go out there and shoot. You know, uh, and you're gonna find for yourself. You know, don't don't listen to that guy that's got ten thousand posts that said this yada yada yada. I I'm kind of the anti. You know. Um, uh, forum guy now, and it, which is funny because I used to do a lot of forums, but I, I I would rather be out on the rage figuring out myself. Certainly, there's a lot of truth and a lot of things people say. I like to just challenge them. So right. Well, there's a lot to be said for actually, uh, you know, in the trenches pragmatism versus mm -hmm. theoretical optimism. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, I agree. Well, so the the matches that are out there. Uh, how are they being sanctioned? Uh, before the show, you mentioned a couple of the bodies that are kind of putting these uh, matches together. So why don't you kind of outline for us if you're going to look for a three-gun competition, where are you going to go to try to figure out what you're shooting, where you're shooting, who you're shooting with? Oh, that's right. Yeah. I mean, like I said, there's um, right now uh, Three Gun Nation have done a great job. Um, they've got a full, uh, website where they actually outline all the scheduled matches, um, you know, all the people involved. They even have a running list of, you know, who your top, you know, 50 or top, you know, top competitive shooters are, even in the amateur ranks. Um, so you get a good understanding uh, for who they are, and you'd be surprised at where they, they come from. Um, but for the most part, um, I like me personally. There's an, uh, another big forum um, that a lot of shooters go to called the Brian Enos Forum, where they post a lot of um, where those locations and events are be happen to be. And that's that's half of the work is is going to those websites of the of the ranges and finding out what the different rules are and talking with some of the people that had competed at these matches and, and uh, as to what to expect. Because I, I think every big match has got some sort of you know, um, this is what they kind of do, sort of deal. And you can kind of get your gear set up for, for, for that type of shooting, so. Based on the rules that you're going to find? Exactly. Yeah. You know, so you'll, you might find, like, a, a, like, take for instance, there's a match that occurs over in Idaho called the Iron Man. Um, at, that that's a particularly very physically demanding uh, match where they have you hauling 160 pound dummies and and coming down um, uh, you know um, coming down zip lines and and all sorts of craziness. I mean it's it's an extremely fun match, but certainly not not for the weak of heart. Uh, but every well, year it that's sells max out. And, that's max entirely too much of work to me. Yeah, it, it does. You know, so there. You know. <laughs> Based on the type of shooter you are, you may want to do a little research on the type of matches that goes on and how they conduct their matches. And then there's matches out in, um, that, you know, focuses a lot on long-range type shooting. And there's matches where it's, it's almost like an endurance race. So, you right. know, for the most part, th those are some of the bigger matches that, that go on. You know, so you, you can, you, there's a lot of information online that, like I said, I, Brian Enos just happens to be a really good forum where a lot of... Um, competitive shooters come and talk and stuff, so for the most part, you can get a lot of information going on there. Okay. Well, and so if if one of our listeners was going to start out, mm -hmm. what what's a minimum that they can expect? They've got to come with what minimum kind of pistol? What minimum kind of shotgun? 
Well, uh, for the most part, um, Three Gun is broken up in in, in uh, these divisions. The most popular being um, Limited, Tac Ops, and Open Division. Um, so, for a newer shooter, it really depends on on their equipment. I mean, for the most part, getting started, because um, I always recommend just don't go crazy and and buying all these things that you think you're going to do. Just bring what you already got at home. Get to the range. I mean, for the most part. Competitive shooters are probably one of the most friendliest people you ever meet. Uh, right. Whenever I find somebody that's new, I don't care if I I just met them. You know, if I I can get them to the range, I'll loan them gear. You know, you'll never find a shortage of people that says, "Hey, man, I got an extra belt, I got an extra rifle shot." I mean, one of my um, one of my better shooters now on the team, I I, I loaned him his shotgun for the first year. You know, and you know he just made dead, and now he's buying a. Of course, now he's buying a, He's bought his own shotgun. Uh, but for the most part, you'll you'll get a lot of people like that that are more than willing to to loan you their gear. You, of course, you got to supply the ammo, but right. <laughs> you know, it, it, I, I'd say a minimum. I mean, if they got an 870, um, some sort of reliable pump shotgun, that'll work. Um, an automatic, even better. Um, you know, uh, for a rifle, an AR-15 is probably the preferred platform. Um, unless you're going into heavy metal division, there's a lot of guys that are running M1s and um, M14s and all that sort of stuff. Um, you know, the minimum caliber for a pistol is a nine millimeter. You probably don't want to go um, too 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 crazy with that. I mean, I would if you shoot a 357 Sig, just that just happens to be what you have. You know, just be prepared to pay for the ammo. I mean, it's not nearly as abundant and cheap as nine millimeter is. I would probably recommend a nine millimeter pistol. Um, you know, something like a Glock will work fine. Most most people have got either a Glock, an XD, or an M&P. Those work just great. Um, and as far as uh, gear, I mean, uh, that's when you start to see, when you first get to your match, and you kind of look around, and you see what people are actually running. Um, you know, you, you, we have these shooting belts that say Safari Land and CR Speed makes that makes it, you know, things a whole lot easier. I've got a couple of examples here. Um, this is actually my uh, Tech Ops rig, and you'll notice it's outfitted with a bunch of shotgun shell holders and stuff. But um, you know, for guys starting out, I've seen guys um, stick shotgun shells in their pockets or you know, magazine and stuff in their pockets. Um, I usually, in my truck, carry a couple of spare magazine holders um, for Glocks and stuff for guys that show up in matches and and don't have anything. You know, um, it's kind of in my spares kit. Um, but for the most part, I've seen a lot of guys, you know, take regular leather belts, strap on an Uncle Mike's leather holster, and and maybe a, a mag pouch from Uncle Mike's. And you know, it, eventually you see those guys when they stick around. Next month they got the nicer holster, and the month after that maybe they'll 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 fork out some dough and get some nice mag pouches, and and eventually they kind of get sucked into the sport. But you you don't need a whole lot to start. You know, um, just a nice sturdy holster that will retain the pistol. You're going to be doing a lot of running around, so you're probably going to want something that won't easily come undone when you're you're doing all these things. Right. Uh, back pockets work great for AR-15 magazines. Um, you know, it, 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 you can certainly get started. You know, um, it, it really comes down on, on the person. You know, if they're they're willing to do those sacrifices and stuff. Yeah, if you don't have mag holders, just wear some cargo pants. You'll be yeah. Good <laughs> that, I've done it. That that works sometimes. I'll go to a stage and I have to go prone, and I say, you know what? It's gonna be better in my back pocket, and I throw it in my back pocket and just run it. Well, let me ask you this: When somebody's made the decision to go, when someone has found a a forum, uh, whoever the the governing body or sanctioning body is. What kind of time can they expect to invest on the day of a competition? Is um, it like a, a 30 minutes and you're out? Is it kind of an all-day affair? You know, get there early, leave at sundown. Kind of, kind of, you know, lay out, lay, lay it out for for the guys that probably haven't ever looked too deeply in it. Oh yeah, no problem. The the local stuff that we have, the monthly matches, they typically start at about ten o'clock, and we usually try to get out around two. So I tell guys it's usually like the same time as a round of golf. You know, <laughs> um, it, it could be as long as you want it to be, and it really depends on if it's a nice sunny day in July. You probably expect that a lot of people that want to come out and shoot. 
Um, I, I shoot all year round in the snow and the sleet because I, I like like my last match. I had a match that I actually uh, ran this weekend. We had a 45 something shooters. It was great because it was a big match, but at the same time we were in and out of there. I was home at three something, you know. So you know it, it does take up a lot of your day. Um, so it, but for the most part, I think it's it's well worth it. <laughs> well, now tell me if you were gonna tell someone. All right, so you're in it, you like it, you want to come back for more. How much time are they going to want or need to invest on a regular basis to become more skilled at their weaknesses? I mean, are we talking to really get anywhere? You have to be an everyday at the range kind of guy, or can you... It depends. It starts to taper off. Certainly when you start out um, as... The much, uh, the most time you can invest in it, you will accelerate, um, you know, rap really quickly. There's some guys that get hooked and you know they they're dry firing, you know, two, three, four times a day. Um, I remember when I first started out, um, when I first classified, I was a B class shooter. Um, I got excited when I got my first little class win, got my taste at a class win, and you know. From that point, I mean, I started to see improvements coming really rapidly, and then I kind of hit this plateau, and that plateau is really, um, you know, to get past that, you really have to ask yourself and dig deep, how bad do you really want it, you know, and that's when you start seeing the calluses on the hands appear, and, and these guys, you know, locking themselves up in the garage, well, you know, just practicing on fundamentals. Um, for the first year, I really benefited a lot from live fire, um, and after that, to really get competitive, I was dry firing anywhere from eight to twelve hours a week. Um, mm -hmm. You know, maybe even more, um, depending on how sleepless I get. The more I lose, the more I want to practice. So, and I lost a lot. So, well, let me ask you this. So, I mean, we've all kind of come to understand a, a lack of ammunition or a, a, an increase in the cost of ammunition. Are there any shortcuts to training? I mean, are oh, you yeah. seeing, uh, you know, the air rifles, air pistols, or uh, what is it, the little, the little plastic BB things? Is it, what, what's oh, the out air, there air. to help you train without breaking the bank? Well, I mean, for the most part, the beautiful thing about the sport is, is uh, it really harps down on your fundamentals. And um, dry firing is something that's free and cheap and easy to do. Um, you know. Um, I, I believe I, there was a time when I was going to the range two, three times a week, and it, I didn't really see uh, my advancements as rapidly as I thought I would, uh, making that sort of investment. I really found that when I locked myself up, and um, you know what I what I initially started doing when I was uh, um, kind of coming up. Um, and I'm, well, I'm still kind of coming up, but um, I, I did a lot of videos of myself, and I would post them on these forums, and I would have you know, higher level shooters kind of um, give me some tips on what I'm doing and what I'm not doing. And that's that's kind of what's, again, that's really cool about the sport. Everyone's all about helping each other uh, improve. And I, I took those elements and I practiced them. And, you know, really, when I go to matches, that's when I really tested, you know, what I learned and, and applied it to um, when, when there's a little bit some sort of uh, pressure that was applied was it was those uh, methodologies going to snap or break, um, and that's really what I do. Um, and now I'm getting to a point where I've not nearly as many weaknesses. I don't get me wrong; I still got a lot to learn, uh, but I'm able to kind of focus in on some very key specific things. I think what a lot of people do is they get to the range and they um, they lose focus because they start goofing off or they start practicing things they're already good at. And I think that's the hardest part is to not worry about what you're good at, but worry about the things that you're not good at. Um, right. One year I made my biggest advancements is when I would go to the range, I wouldn't do my draws or reloads because those, those were two things I was, you know, I, I, I was decent at. Uh, I would practice on weak hand, strong hand shooting and really isolating those weaknesses and, and getting to the point where, you know, when I got to a match that dictated weak hand, strong hand shooting, it's like, all right, cool. Now I get to now I get to see if if all my hard work is for nothing. And sure enough, I mean that those are the type of things that they throw at you that sometimes people don't want to practice um, that will really separate you 
uh, from yeah. the other people. So it's really, it, you have to be truthful with yourself about where your weaknesses and strengths lie. And and because you know not everyone's got all the time in the world to practice. Um, with two kids now, it makes it even more crucial for me to really focus on the things I really need to work on, as opposed to goofing off and doing the things I'm already good at. So. Right. Well, let me ask you this: you, you mentioned dry firing, and so can you kind of break down just that little component? What is it that you're doing? What is it supposed to accomplish? Mm -hmm. How do you know you're doing it right? How do you know you're doing it wrong? Kind of can can you explain that for us? Sure. Yeah. I mean, dry fire is really just the application of repetition. Um, it's just repeatedly um, drawing your holster, um, getting a good sight picture, um, and I use different aids like um, really small targets. Um, a good buddy of mine over in Texas had said. You know, you're, you're, you know, ask me, what, what do you dry fire on? And I, you know, I tell him a full-size IPSEC target. He goes, well, you're doing it wrong. You need smaller targets, um, especially when a closer range. So um, if you go into my man cave, so to speak, you'll see a lot of little black dots all over the place. That they're, they're entirely purposeful. Um, you know, those are, those are my dry fire targets now. Um, and I also use a timer. Um, the timer is my method for um, inducing stress. So I have a part-time um, that I set that I continuously try to beat. Like for a shotgun reloading, um, you know, the standard was to get eight, you know, weekend reloads within eight seconds. And once you get that down to the point where you're doing that 100%, you lower your part-time to seven and a half seconds and then seven seconds. And you right. continuously try to push yourself um, to the point of breaking until you get to a point where you said, okay, it's impossible to do this. And you just just hammer away at it um, continuously to push that part time and so that really helps um, when you come to matches you know you're used to that stress you're used to that repetition um, and there's again there's no way to buy your game out of it or, or there, you, you simply have to pay your dues you know so I mean using uh, small targets so it's all about snapping to your transitions so your gun isn't wavering you're getting a good clean side picture um, you know, really focusing on the type of sight picture um, that you're getting. If I'm, I, I shoot a lot of open division, which is a, a, a different kind of sight picture in itself. So I'm, I'm focusing more on snapping my eyes to a hard target focus as opposed to a front side focus when I'm using or shooting iron guns. So. Right. Well, so tell me when you're sh when you're dry firing with the pistol, are you using just the same pistol that you would take to the Competitions, or oh, are you using like a training pistol, like a cert training pistol, or is, is it some third choice? I mean, um, there there are a lot of great options. Um, I have a buddy um, uh, that owns a company that sells these um, these Glock, like they're, they're cert pistols, um, and you could use those. Those are great training aids, and they're very safe. Um, you could see where your, your your sights are really going and when you pull the trigger where it's, what it's actually doing when you pull the trigger uh, but me myself I like practicing with the actual guns um, you certainly have to have a strong sense of you know safety um, when you're using live guns and I make sure when I dry fire um, that I don't have any ammunition in the room whatsoever and stuff I uh, but I'm all a firm believer of just getting real intimate with your gun I mean I these guns, when they hit the range, I've probably already spent hours and hours um, holding them, and just the familiarity aspect of flipping the safety, hitting the mag release, all that repetition really helps. Right, right. So, um, for newer three-gun shooters, what what do you see as uh, some of the first upgrades they do to their AR-15? Um, Typically, you'll see two things. Um, it's going to usually be their compensator and their sight system. Uh, those are two things that, right off the bat, um, you can get some really, um, you know, you can get some really good progress or you know, um, performance from your pistol right away. Um, if you can't control the recoil, you're not going to be able to shoot fast enough. And if you can't see what you're shooting, you're not going to be able to hit it. So, um, you know, it's one of the toughest pills to kind of swallow. Because for the most part, people go, "Geez, I just spent a thousand dollars on this AR, and you're telling me I I need to spend another thousand for a good optic set." 
So, you know, people go kind of dance around it and they'll try to find the most budget, you know, $99 um, optic set. And then they find that it's not, you know, what they really need. You know, it's, I'm kind of a firm believer in buy once, cry once. You know, I'd rather eat PBA, uh, peanut butter je jelly sandwiches for a month and get exactly what I want than sit there and buy something and, and know that I don't have what I want. So, right. um, yeah, you, getting a good optic, getting a good compensator, you know, uh, no matter what rifle you start off with, it probably going to be the, the first two, two big things. So what, what kind of optic systems then? Uh, do, you, do you see a lot of three gunners run? Um, for the most part, um, probably the most versatile optic out there um, is this optic right here. It's the uh, one in four optic. Um, it's great because at one time magnification, um, I could still shoot with both eyes open. Um, you know, for the most part, I could shoot a lot of uh, closer targets. And at longer range, which at most decent gu uh, three gun matches, there'll be a lot of, um, I could crank it up to four time magnification. For the most part, that'll usually get the job done. Um, you know, there's certainly some matches that have targets up to six, seven hundred yards and stuff. Um, but uh, for the most part, this, I mean, this is my open gun. Uh, it's actually got two optic sets, um, both of them Vortex. Uh, I've got a Vortex red dot mounted at a 45 degree angle and a Vortex 1 and 4 as kind of my longer range stuff. So for the close stuff, I use the the red dot, and for the uh, medium range stuff, I use my primary optic. But you can run this kind of optic uh, in, you know, uh, tack ops and 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 open. Um, you know, for the most part, I th when I want to shoot at tack ops, I just take the red dot off, and I'm I'm shooting with the same rifle. Again, it's just building that familiarity with that rifle um, to the point where you you're not really thinking much about it. Um, you know, you, you, you're familiar with it. So um, another great optic that people use are red dots. And this is probably more prevalent in the limited division. Um, so this is a um, Vortex uh, Viper. This is not a very expensive red dot. Um, but this is a, also another very popular option. Um, Aim points, EOTex, they're already really popular. Um, even if you're not a three-gun competitor, you probably have one on your rifle already. Um, I don't believe that they're a limiting factor. Um, you know, a lot of people get concerned about shooting long range and stuff. I've got a teammate who runs an EOTech. Um, we were just at a match a couple weeks ago. We had a long range stage and we had a bonus target out the 400 something yards. Um, and he has a 14 5 inch barrel. And I think he took it down in a couple, maybe four or five shots. It took him a little while to dope it out, but I mean, it certainly wasn't an impossible shot. You know, so it really comes down to how well do you know you're zero, you know. Right. Well, very cool. So we have a rifle. We we um, do a few upgrades. What, what do you see people going to after that? Uh, after that, they'll probably rebuild their upper. Um, you really start to crank out your accuracy once you work on your upper receiver group and your, your barrel. Um, that's when you kind of really, you know, when you're, you're you when you get tired of that three inch MOA or that three MOA, um, and you're looking for that sub MOA gun. Um, that's usually what you do. Uh, you'll go with a national match bolt or some sort of high end uh, match match grade bolt carrier group. Get a headspace to a nice quality um, ultra or um, stainless steel barrel like our ultra match, um, and then top it off with a nice compensator, and then um, well, actually, even before that, uh, one of the more popular upgrades a lot of uh, new three-gun shooters like to do is the long handguard, uh, which not only looks cool, but it's actually very functional, uh, especially for what we do. Because what we do is we shoot a lot over bunkers or um, you know barricades. Um, you shoot a lot through ports, and you're resting that barrel or or that upper on on a lot of very awkward things. I was shooting off of um, hay bales and, and, all, and rooftops. So what you really want to do is you want to keep anything from hitting your barrel because any kind of deflection on your barrel will translate down range. Um, so free flow handguard is, is easily one of probably one of the most popular upgrades for your upper. Um, unfortunately, the, the, the thing that yields the best results is going to be the, your bolt and your, um, and your barrel. 
Now, I would have guessed. Know. I would have guessed Trigger would have came before all these other options. Oh yeah, that's that's also a pretty popular option. Sorry, yeah, yeah. The tr Trigger is uh, another good one. Um, having a good trigger certainly helps uh, in the accuracy department. Um, yeah, so handguard, trigger, uh, barrel, bar I mean, I, I guess I'm looking at it from a techie perspective, not just because right. I, I work here and I, and because I'm the captain, I, I can get pretty much whatever I want. <laughs> so um, that, yeah, that's only great. Up. Um, and, and then the next one would probably be our, our Raptor charging handle. Um, there's a lot of uh, weapons manipulation coming out of the barrels unloaded that you have to um, rack your, your rifle and, and coming in and out and stuff. And then, of course, that, that trusty rifle experiencing that death jam. You know, you, you never appreciate a really good charging handle until you have to grenade that thing on the ground, you know, because it's, it's, it's locked up harder. Um, when you have that wimpy mil-spec charging handle, you're like, oh, my God, I would do anything right now to have a bigger charging handle. Um, and yeah, you, you really start to grow to appreciate that right after charge handle. Well, when you're when you're talking about a, a fully customized three gun rig, is weight a big consideration, or is it just a function of what you feel your AR needs to have on it to get out there? I and think a lot of guys for carbon fiber barrels and carbon fiber. Uh, hand guards and things like that, or do you just pick what works and makes it accurate, and makes it fast? Um, I, I I pick what works. Um, there used to be a huge concern over weight, and there we we call them kind of Weight Watcher guys. They they would they would find any little piece to lighten up, and and really what it comes down to me now, uh, at least where I'm at, uh, I really um, even more important than weight is balance, because um, getting that rifle swinging it around. Um, you're manipulating it through ports and all that sort of thing. Weight is is not nearly as a huge concern. I tell people all the time, you have this wonderful thing in your body called adrenaline. Um, so when that thing starts going and you start feeling the pressure, that that nine pound rifle all of a sudden turns into a five pound rifle. Right. Um, you know, because for the most part, you know, most of our stages will be you'll be in and out of off a of stage, typically for a three gun match in less than two minutes, hopefully. Um, you know, and it, you really don't have enough time to fatigue. Um, so having a gun that balances right and controls recoil, and for the most part, you see a lot of guys running heavier rifles. Um, that's because it also allows their gun to track really flat and straight. Um, uh, JP guns is probably one of the more uh, popular guns out there in the three-gun circuit, and you'll see them with huge 936 bull barrels on there. Um, that that's not a um, that's that's actually uh, a very smart um, way to go about it because you, you your gun shoots a little bit more flatter. And again, we're not having to carry these around on duty for ten hours a, a day type thing. So weight isn't nearly as big as a concern uh, for three gun. Um, I I used to chase after that, and then my gun was just like hopping around all over the place. I said, you know what? Screw that. You know, I went with a full size gun, twenty inch rifle, and I never I never looked back. Well, very cool. What we um getting towards the end of uh, the main topic. So, Reed, why, why don't you ask him uh, one more, one more uh, question? And I'll hit one more question, and then uh, Ari will will give you a chance to plug some stuff over there at uh, Rainier. All right. So, uh, all right. When it comes down to the three gun competitions, is the investment of ammunition to actually be in the competition going to break the bank? I mean, what are we going to go to the competition with in your in your ammo crate to get you through a full full course of action, a full course of shooting? Um, for the most part, it really depends on the type of matches you attend. Um, most monthly matches will be good where you bring anywhere between 125 to 150 rounds of rifle. Um, same thing with shotgun. Um, you know, less than 100 typically. Um, for these bigger matches, of course, the, you're going to probably want to bring more. When I'm on the road, I use the one-third rule. So if it's if it's a 150 round count rifle, I'll probably bring uh, about 450 rounds um, just just to have a little. It's 
it's better to not to have and not need. Um, right. But for the most part, you, you don't want to run out of ammunition at a match. You know, it's it's always nicer to bring some home as opposed to needing some or having to loan it from your friend. But for the most part, um, it's usually a hundred of each, hundred shotgun. 100 rifle and 100 pistol and you, you typically are pretty good. That's depend on how bad of a day you, you're having. It's a lot like bringing golf balls with you when you go golfing. Are you the guy that right, brings right. the 12 pack or you just bring a sleeve? Um, the better you go, the, the less ammo you need to bring. So, um, you know, for three gun competitions, I usually, for local stuff, I'll bring 150 or so of each one and I'll usually have plenty of home to bring, him, to bring back home. So, it's not too terribly bad. Um, again, it each place is going to be a little different, but if the MD is real smart about it, he'll be cautious about the ammo. I try not to create matches when I'm the match director where it's going to like try to break the bank for the people. I, I realize people have got to, got to also eat and uh, spend their money elsewhere besides ammunition. So um, for the most part, the quality of match is going to be dictated based on the difficulty of the stages, not just having a high round count. And is that ammunition higher end? Or are you going to go in there with, you know, double lot, straight up full metal jacket, nine millimeter ball, uh, you know, the 55 grain, two, two, three, or, or are you going to be kind of on the bleeding edge of your caliber choice, your, your, your bullet choices and loads? I, I bring some, I, I bring some heavier stuff at uh, some of these big matches, but for my local stuff, I, I, I run the standard Hornaday 55 grain uh, FMJs that you can get in bulk packs and stuff, even at this. Um, it wasn't really a major. It was just more like an annual match, but there are a couple of big names that come out there you want to shoot against. I, I was running 55 grains, and I was doing. I didn't feel like I didn't have enough bullet going out to 350, 400 yards at all. Um, it, it's also, you know, you got to be very confident with knowing where that bullet's going and what it's going to do in the different kind of uh, elements. Because there's some ranges like the one we just competed at, where it's in this huge gulch. And there's three flags out there blowing in different directions. You know, uh, when, when you go into those kind of stuff, you definitely want to go with a heavier bullet. And but you want to make sure your gun's set up for it. I've got a different gun set up for heavier bullets. Um, my 20 is actually set up for 55 grain. So anything inside of 400 yards, I'm pretty, I'm usually pretty good with. Um, so yeah. All right. Well, so. Jake, those are my questions. <laughs> Top that. Oh, you mentioned how many golf balls you take golfing. I'd have to take a five-gallon <laughs> bucket. <laughs> uh, so let, let's say a guy wants to, let's say he tried out a few gr three-gun matches, maybe even using a buddy's rifle or something, and he's looking he's looking to buy a, a, a three-gun rifle, so an AR-15 that's pretty much already has a lot of these upgrades done that he might want to do. What what kind of price range, what kind of brands am I looking at for something like that? Um, I, I would, again, try to defer probably to our Rainier Ruck. At, at 1500 bucks. you're probably not needing a whole lot besides maybe a really good optic. Um, but, you know, certainly there are brands like DPMS that can get you into a rifle that's going to be pretty close to um, being race ready for right around the 1200 to $1,300 mark. Again, it, you're not going to get nearly as many upgrades as we have in our ruck, um, but you know certainly it'll be enough for you to get out there and start participating in. And you know for the most part with a rifle it's it's easy because you can kind of start off with a great um, you know base of a rifle um, and just build up from there as you need it. Buy your trigger when you get a chance, get a compensator, get a good optic for set for it. And that's what's kind of cool about the AR rifle in competition. You could basically start off with a standard 20-inch government, you know, and you know, evolve it from there um, based on what you really need next. And I, for a lot of guys, I know that's how they did it. And now I'm seeing them out there, and they've got you know, totally tricked out. What looks like a totally tricked out AR, but I knew for a fact, you know, like every weekend I would see something new on their rifle and stuff. So I mean, as long as you have a good base rifle, you know, um, a Daniel Defense or a, a DPMS. I mean, you can build up on that slowly. It's not exactly necessary to come out there completely tricked out and stuff, because for the most part, you know, guys that are still trying to establish their skill set are not going to be able to really capitalize on some of those upgrades yet anyways. 
most of your upgrades will come from spending time on the range and just getting familiar with your rifle. Um, it's not really until you get more to the upper third of that comp competitive group where you really would start to see the yielding or the effects of, of these better equipment. Um, but certainly there are some things that can limit or hamper your, 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 excel your growth in the sport, um, but for the most part, there's not a lot of things that you really, really need uh, to get started. Oh, you're making you're not selling me on this. You're making it sound like hard work where I have to actually practice. <laughs> <laughs> well, it really depends. I mean, you know, I I I, I may say that, but I, I'm also um, uh, one of the biggest gear uh, guys out there when it, when it comes. To, I mean, I, I'm always at. The fact that it's part of my job really makes it uh, re really helps. Not really, um, but you know, I'm I'm always coming to John with new stuff. It's like, hey, have you seen this? Hey, these guys are making these new things, and and it's it's kind of been a dream come true job for me. But um, you know, it, it, that's the God honest truth. There's a lot of guys that say, hey, I, I don't want to sit there and spend a whole lot of money to have to compete. And I'm saying you don't have to do that. But if you are the type where you like gear. And you like to shoot? Well, God, this thing is like it's, it's going to be. You're going to go crazy with it, um, and just like I am. I mean, I, I can't tell you how many times I've reconfigured this rifle to suit my needs. I um, mean, this thing has evolved like crazy. And what occurs is you'll you'll say, you know what? I'm I'm going to start from scratch. I'm going to build another uh, another upper. Well, guess what? That upper finds a new lower, and all <laughs> of a sudden you have to build that. And this is how ARs. Start to multiply in your in your safe, you know. Yeah. And it's, it's kind of a crazy fit. They're like, like leaving rabbits. They're like tribbles. Yeah, they do. Yeah. Next thing you know, you've got all these purpose-built ARs. But yeah, that's how it starts. Well, are you need to ask Jake what he took to his uh, three-gun competition the last couple times? All right, Jake. What did you take to your last couple couple competitions? Oh well. Uh, just the last one, actually, we brought a rifle that we're giving away on the show. No, no, before no. that. What did I brought before? Oh, <laughs> it wasn't an AR. You're talking about the M1 carbine? Yes. <laughs> yeah, so you don't even need an AR to start out. No, so. you don't. You just... it, it, it's not ideal, though. <laughs> no, no. You, you're certainly going to, um, you're not helping yourself much there. <laughs> Yeah, I, I used um, M1 carbine uh, last couple times. La that was last year, but uh, mm -hmm. I thought I'd run something uh, a little retro. But <laughs> I, well, I used I used lead reloads in it, and that thing was like a smoke smoking. screen. I'm like, yeah. where are my targets? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, it, speaking of uh, um, practicing, I I also used a lot of like. 22 uppers, and um, I, I had an M&P 1522 that I would practice a lot with. And it, at a lot of local matches, they actually allow you to run those too. So if you're you're hard up on getting 223 ammo, you get a 22 top for your AR and have at it. Did you see a setback in the ability to have competitions when we were when we, I guess in the last what four years we've had two major scarcity. Uh, runs. Have you seen a lot of uh, damage done to the competitive side of uh, things when people can't get the ammo, or has it really not impacted these guys as badly? I mean, I'm uh, sure they're a lot better stocked when it comes to reloading than the average Joe. Yeah, um, that's 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 the kind of thing. That's the thing that kind of separates us. We do sp spend a lot more on ammunition and. You know, my buddies when they buy, um, you know, the guys that, that buy the ammunition, it's it, they'll typically get, you know, uh, um, anywhere from uh, five thousand to maybe sixty thousand at a time, so that they have a, a good stock hold. We, for the most part, are not the type that go, all right, I got a competition, let me go run to Walmart real quick and go pick up some ammunition. We usually have a couple thousand sitting in our garage. Um, even when I was, um, I, I, I'm very fortunate. I, I, I shoot for a couple of ammunition companies, so they, they keep me pretty well stocked and make sure that I got what I need to shoot. Um, but yeah, I, for the most part, I, I didn't see a, a huge decrease. I certainly saw a huge decrease in newer shooters um, that were coming coming on board. Um, 
And it wasn't even a huge decrease because I did a lot of the, the safety checks. I was the guy that you come to see when you wanted to shoot. And I, I checked you out and make, made sure that you knew what the rules were, that you understand all the safety issues and that sort of thing. And I would average anywhere from two to five people a month that would call me up and say, hey, I want to get started. Uh, um, you know, can, you, can we do a, a, a safety certification? You know, um, you know, but it did drop to where I was getting maybe only one to three a month. Um, but you know, for the most part, the guys that are in it, um, I didn't see a whole lot of people staying home. Um, maybe it's because all us crazy guys like to stick together, but uh, all my friends just kept shooting. Uh, but certainly we were a little bit more selective. Um, you know, maybe we didn't hit as many majors as we used to, um, but yeah, it, it uh, maybe a little bit of effect. But for the most part, um, as you notice, like even with the recession, there are certain creature comforts that people weren't willing to give up, like their cell phones, for instance. You know, no, you didn't see anybody giving their phones up because they they right. got to a point where they felt like it was a pure necessity. Um, and for guys that shoot, and um, you know, ammunition is a pure necessity. So. All right, before Reed breaks into another question, uh, Ari, tell, tell us about some things uh, we can pick up at Rainier Arms. Oh, yeah, sure, awesome. Yeah, um, Rainier Arms, uh, you know, again, we, we've got um, the Raptor Charging Handle. This is probably the most uh, popular uh, accessory that um, has probably hit the mark in the past several years. Um, this certainly has been one of our number one selling items and stuff, but... Um, for the most part, we work with a lot of higher end companies. Um, so, you know, for the most part, you'll know that you shop with us. We, we, we have, uh, you know, we're kind of the, the Neiman Marcus of AR 15s or, or rifles. Uh, you know, everything we carry is pretty much high end and stuff. But, um, you know, Vortex Optics is another really big um, uh, seller for us, or at least a more popular uh, item that people come to, come to us for. Um, Handguards, I don't know that there's anyone else that carries more handguards than we do, at least for selection-wise. Um, that's another really popular thing that people come to us for. Um, Geisley trigger groups, um, I run Geisleys on all, all my ARs. Um, I've got a couple of ARs set up for different uh, divisions and stuff, but some of the things that remain consistent on all my rifles are a rapid charging handle, Geisley trigger, and a Vortex optic. Um, for the most part, I, I, I've got a couple different receivers and stuff. Um, Rainy Arms built lowers, uh, mega uppers, like this is a mega side charging upper right here. Um, compensators, uh, for the most part, we're, we're doing much better stocking a lot of competition parts because uh, for the most part, um, Rainy Arms have been you know, primarily a lot of law enforcement, military hard use type stuff. We're, we're more getting more and more into the three gun market now. Uh, but, you know, optics, um, pretty much everything, um, you know, that's all we do. That's the one thing that's really unique about us. Um, you know, we don't, we're not a, uh, you know, everything shop. We really specialize in the AR-15. Oh, very cool. Now, did you bring some other uh, show-and-tell items? Yeah, yeah. I, I, I've got a couple of other stuff uh, uh, for, for pistols and stuff. Uh, this is my... Um, this is also my USPSA gun, but for the most part, this is the gun I use for my tactical op, tech ops and stuff. It's a 40 caliber uh, SDI built by uh, Trip Research. Um, so I use this in pistol competitions, but I'm also able to, to use it in three gun for certain divisions. Um, this is also my baby. Um, this gun's probably got um, upwards of up, up to maybe 100,000 rounds to it. Um, but you know, before I got it, it was also owned by another local master. But you could tell, kind of, by the rust and and the faded bluing on this. This gun has gone through war with me more than a couple times. It's yeah, it's hold, real hold it up a little higher. There you go. So, so what is that one? Uh, this is an SBI uh, custom uh, open gun. Um, you know, there's it was built uh, by SBI. But over the years, it's gone through a lot of different transformations and stuff. Um, Schumann barrel, um, a titanium compensator. Um, and it's it's pretty pretty well tricked out, but it's also got some miles on her. And this is my open shotgun. This is a uh, 
Sega uh, 12 gauge. Um, you know, it's a auto feeding shotguns. Fun little toy. When she when she runs, she's pretty awesome. But um, these guns can be pretty finicky, especially the shotgun. This is probably easily the 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 most finickiest gun um, in the whole three gun thing. Is it, it, it three guns really a war of attrition? <laughs> you know, it, when you're when your equipment's running, it's awesome, you know. But um, for the most part, it's probably the most difficult part. My my rifles always run. My pistols um, can be finicky, but for the most part, they're pretty ninety percent. Um, but the shotgun that that can really um, when the shotgun goes down, it, it could be really bad for you. And this is my uh, I don't know if you can see it. This is my uh, tactical uh, ops. Uh, um, shotguns, a semi-automatic uh, Mossberg 930 that I've outfitted, uh, opened up the loading port, um, welded the uh, lift gate, um, it's got the extended bolt release, um, it's got the super long tube, I don't know if you can probably see it, there you go. Um, too long, you can't even yeah. put it in the picture. <laughs> yeah, it's, it, it's a 12 plus 1 uh, by Nordic Components. Um, it's got the uh, screwable um, or hand tightened uh, chokes made by Briley. Um, yeah, this is a fun little gun. Um, you know, I, I I kind of bounce around between shotguns because again, I'm still looking for that perfect shotgun. Everything else in my in my stable is pretty solid. Um, I'll, I'll I'll probably be buried with some of these things. So. Well, have you tried that Benelli M4? Oh yeah, yeah. That's a that Benelli's are really nice, certainly. But I mean, this this Mossberg has, like I said, this is actually the gun that I loaned one of my teammates for the past season. Um, and we, because we shoot so much ammo, it's nice to not have to shoot really expensive ammo. So I mean, I could run Walmart junk through this Mossberg, and it'll always run. Um, I've got no affiliation with Mossberg, but I, <laughs> I really like their shotguns. Uh, it's nothing too fancy. It's a lot like a Glock pistol. It's probably not something I'm going to brag about. It's it's not it's not any uh, um, Benelli or anything, but it's it's worked for me. So. Well, Ari, thank you so much for joining us here on the AR15 podcast. Uh, what where can listeners and viewers go to find uh, uh, and follow Rainier? Um Well, we're really active on our multimedia, or I'm sorry. Uh, uh, social media networks, Facebook. Uh, we do a lot of announcements. We got a lot of followers there. We probably see a lot of our um, uh, announcements go through there. And of course, uh, all the popular forums like Air15.com, Weapon Evolution, um, you know, M4 Carbine. You know, for the most part, we're 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 pretty prevalent in all of the um, big uh, forums and stuff and such. And uh, we, we have an Instagram, follow us on Instagram. Uh, I, I like to do a lot of leaks and stuff through Instagram so people want to see what's new, what's what's coming up. Um, I'm, I'm also on there as uh, Rainier Alpha Bravo, so I like to give um, some of the subscribers a little peek at some of the things that hits my desk because I'm a guy who, who often gets uh, some of the new products and stuff that I get to vet. And I'll, sometimes I'll put stuff on there and say, hey, what do you guys think? You know, and I'll get a little um, opinion based on, on, you know. So I, sometimes I might make some big dis business decisions based on that. But uh, for the most part, um, you know, we're, we're, we're all over Facebook and, and all that. So, And, of course, um, our website, rainierarms.com. So. Well, very cool. Thank you so much again for taking the time out of your busy schedule. And uh, maybe... Uh, We'll run into each other at a three-gun event one of these awesome. days. Awesome! Yeah, I'd, I'd love that. Well, we we've got a couple. We got a couple. We're, we're um, I'm in the process of scheduling our team's uh, um, uh, matches for next year, so you just let me know. <laughs> well, are you going to the uh, what is it? The shot show, three-gun. I'm hoping to. Uh, we'll, we'll see. Like I said, I I've got a six-month-old, and she can be uh, a little needy. No. Um, I, I'm hoping to, for sure. Well, I think the the network is going to send many of our reporters out to SHOT Show, so maybe we'll get a chance to run into you there. I'll look forward to it. All right, well, we'll uh, talk to you soon, Harry. Take care. Hey, sounds good. Thanks, Jake. Thank you.
right. Well, that was a great interview with Harry, our first, uh, one of our first ones, wasn't it, Reed? Well, I think so. Live anyways. So it worked quite well. All right. Well, the show's running a little long, so let's uh, just dive into the week, uh, the weekly Otis Bone Tool and O12 Carbon Remover Giveaway. Reed, All right. take it away. Well, uh, this week's winner for uh, the O12 Carbon Remover and Otis Bone Tool Giveaway uh, is going to be Peter S. from California. I think that's the 51st state, isn't it? Or no, no, no. He's talking about California, isn't he? <laughs> so Peter writes in, Jake and Reed, first of all, I'd like to thank you for all the time and work you guys put towards the AR-15 podcast. I've listened to all of your episodes but never had a chance to write in. So here's my first message to you guys. Have you got a bug problem? Hey, carry out. I'm swatting flies here. Keep I see that. So here's my first message to you guys. Your podcast is easily my favorite podcast. Five stars across the board. Please sign me up for your giveaway gifts. Anything free is good for me. So, well, I guess we've, we've met Peter's expectations here. So he says, I live here in California and have built many different AR-15s from ground up out of pure joy and to share my love of firearms with others, including new shooters. Most were built for friends, family, and co-workers, and I've, I have experienced with many, many different AR setups and parts from different manufacturers and shot many different configurations. I openly talk about firearms to all my co-workers and family members, in which at least 12 of them have purchased firearms after I've taken them shooting multiple times. People need to realize that firearms is a fun and great hobby and not evil as the news portrays them to be. One thing I get confused with is with some of your California listeners about not being able to get AR parts, since some businesses will not ship to California. Anytime I helped build for others, I've never had, I've never had been denied of any parts being shipped to me, besides the obvious parts which would be deemed illegal in this commie state. And he continues, feel free to send my email out to any of your listeners that have a hard time, and I will gladly direct them to the right websites which would love to have their business. I'm an active member of CalGuns and am always on different websites looking for details and parts, or deals and parts, so I'm confident I can help any of your California listeners. Once again, five stars to you guys, and I plan on writing to you guys a whole lot. P.S. Need an extra host? Smiley face. Yeah, if you're if you're serious, uh, send us your demo uh, tape, Peter. All right. So I guess that's something I should bring up. I'm looking to replace myself here on the AR15 podcast, and Reed will be taking over the show, and so we're looking for a producer slash host to uh, fill my role here to. Uh, Help Reed uh, create the show to uh, edit and post the show. So you can send a, a demo or email to Jake at uh, firearmsradio.tv or Jake at ar15podcast.com. Well, I think that about wraps up the show. Any final thoughts, Reed? Well, we're, what, two weeks away from a... Black Rifle Giveaway, is it? That's right. Just two weeks away, and I ran um, I ran the gun uh, this Sunday, so yesterday. Uh, I, did I say I was giving it away? Did, were those my exact words? <laughs> yes. Yes, they were. It's Perhaps. recorded, and you posted that recording on the Internet, so it's permanent. Ugh. I, I got to plan better next time. So well, so the drawings on the tenth of October, correct? Yeah, I believe so. Yep. And that's a Thursday, so we'll be announcing the winner Monday, October fourteenth, on the air. Yep. On Google Hangouts. And uh, so, 
Yeah, and the day day after that, the Firearms Insider Community launches. So that's something else I want to put a shout or a heads up here for is that uh, the Firearms Insider Community, you know, it's going to be uh, a site uh, as gun and gear reviews, but not just that, also a blog um, where we have multiple contributors from the industry and the network. So I'm okay. uh, really looking forward to launching that and uh, creating uh, a place uh, where, you know, we can all provide uh, some feedback on different uh, uh, products and gear. Like, for example, if you uh, want to do a gun Gunner Gear Review will have an outline form that um, you can follow and um, submit uh, your thoughts on it. Well, so tell me, we, we put one of our stronger uh, uh, podcast hosts in charge of the, the whole Firearms Insider Network, isn't it? That's right, yeah. Mike from the God and Guns podcast is stepping down from God and Guns. Troy's taking that show over, and he's uh, the director of the Firearms Insider. And we're currently actually looking for a host for the Firearms Insider podcast. I have a few possibilities, um, so we'll, we'll see uh, what happens there. But what we will have on that podcast feed right away are mini, uh, mini-sodes, mini-episodes. I'm calling them mini-sodes. Uh, where, are where, they going to be on the internet? Because aren't those called webisodes? Web, uh, yeah, call it whatever you want. <laughs> <laughs> so th those will be on it right away. Short, like uh, five to ten minute re audio reviews, and there there'll be video reviews, written reviews, and then blog posts that um, will be multiple um, personalities posting to the blog. Uh, I'm going to post a few opinion pieces, and so uh, wide, uh, wide a selection of content, uh, you know, for, should be something for everyone on there. Okay. And we're, look, we're looking to raise uh, $1,000 to help pay for the hosting for the next year. Uh, so if you'd like to contribute to uh, the Firearms Insider, you can uh, go to firearmsradio.tv slash uh, Donate, I believe, and uh, you can uh, help uh, our cause. So well, I and it. you know, Jake, you you were always too humble about this. You know, for for the guys who are going to sit down and listen to the show tonight, Jake puts every ounce of himself into the show, into getting the network running, into getting all of these shows off the ground. There is. You know, the man's blood, his sweat, and his tears on everything. We have to carry towels. It's gross. But the point is is that he has his fingers in it all, and if it were not for Jake and the sacrifices he may, makes on a regular basis, none of us would have the benefit of the network or any of these podcasts. And so, you know, for something that you essentially have the benefit of for free, all that we're asking is that, that you, you, you go to the gunguyradio.com gun forward slash love link and help us out. You know, a dollar helps. You know, five dollars helps. Whatever you feel comfortable doing. And, and Jake is going to continue to do his very best to get all of this stuff out there. But, you know, I think it's worth a little bit of sacrifice to make it easier on the man. So I would encourage you. I would I would implore you. Visit the link. Help check out. Help out the network because we're all here for the same thing. All right. Well, that about wraps up the show. You know, before I wrap it up, I I, I should mention that we have a couple other rifle uh, style podcasts coming to the network. They may not be. Well, I guess. It may include AR-15s, but uh, the Pre Precision Rifle Podcast, PRP, uh, you can look for it on the uh, Firearms Radio Network Master Feed. I think there's, I think there's three episodes of it up now. You know, and, I'm gonna have to start bugging them with questions. And and uh, also the Competitive Rifle Podcast, so C uh, P P C R P C R P. All right. 
Yeah, I think maybe you need to get some new initials for that one. <laughs> oh, I guess yes. it's better than the uh, competitive rifle and podcast. Competitive pistol podcast? That would be CPP. Yeah, yeah, that would be. <laughs> so, yeah, they're coming on the network soon, so stay tuned. Uh, and you can send your uh, questions and comments to us here at the Air 15 Podcast to feedback at AR15Podcast.com. I believe you can reach Reed at Reed at AR15Podcast.com. And don't forget to record a voicemail message on the upper right-hand side of the website with the SpeakPipe plug-in. And to enter for the AR-15 that we're giving away in just a few weeks, uh, you can upload your pictures to our Flickr group, flickr.com slash group slash black rifle, or click the giant Flickr logo on the right-hand side of error15podcast.com. And we have 643 pictures on this site now. Well, and just for the sake of clarification, shall uh, we... End the entry period at midnight in whatever time zone you exist on October 9th. Um, yeah, right. Fair enough? Well, it, it, midnight, it would be the 10th, right? If it was midnight, if it was 12 a.m., it would be the 10th, technically. No, it's 12.01. That 11.59 p.m., on, t on, t on the ninth, right? All right, all right. <laughs> so, so you have a deadline. I know we've got a lot of a lot of listeners who've entered. That is your that is your deadline. There's a lot of new photos on here that were really awesome. There's a guy dual wielding uh, some ARs here. <laughs> now wait a minute. I'm a, I'm a bit of a purist. I think that's a little too arny, if you ask me. <laughs> no, uh, track, track soul. Track soul. Yeah, he's got a lot of good ones up here. Anyway, so you can uh, uh, upload them to the Flickr group, and you can also leave us a review on iTunes. We'll cover some of those reviews next week, but uh, go to... Uh, AR15podcast.com slash iTunes. And uh, you can watch the show live by following us on the firearmsradio.tv slash plus. That's our Google uh, plus page for the Firearms Radio Network. And you can also watch these uh, uh, podcast uh, shows on uh, YouTube, I think it's called. <laughs> and uh, don't forget, uh, you know... Uh, Subscribe and listen uh, to the other shows on the Firearms Radio Network. Firearmsradio.tv slash iTunes is our master feed, and you can listen and download all of the great shows. And we're constantly expanding to meet the needs of our listeners. Constantly. I, I Yeah, okay. Well, we'll see you next week. Have a good night.